Are the meeting open to the public? Uh, can I inform members that the following member will be joining the meeting through teleconferencing? That's Gemma Dolan, MLA, uh, who is with us here on the screen. Can I advise members that they are welcome to use the Wi-Fi connected mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and all devices are muted? Uh, if members are content, then I'll proceed through the agenda as follows. Apologies, number one, apologies, and that's one from Matthew O'Toole, and then also the chair person, uh, Steve Egan. Are there any other apologies? I don't think that there is. I think we're all here, present. Uh, can I rem remind members that they are obligated to declare any relevant financial or any other interests at each committee meeting as applicable? Sure, I declare my interest in my own bill. Okay, Jim. Thank you very much. Uh, item number two, then. Uh, draft minutes of proceedings of the 8th of July 2020. Can I inform members the draft minutes of the meeting on 8th of July are at pages five? Can I ask members if they are content that the draft minutes are an accurate record of proceedings? Agreed? Agreed. Content? Agreed. If agreed, the minutes will be published on the website. Uh, revised draft minutes of proceedings of the 1st of July 2020. Can I remind members that these draft minutes were agreed at the 8th of July 2020 and the following, following the meeting an error was identified. The minutes are, were corrected and forwarded to members to consider on the 1st of September 2020. Can I inform members the amended minutes are at page 12? Can I ask members if they are content with the amended minutes as uh, an accurate record of the proceedings on that day? Members agreed. content? Okay, agreed. So uh, can I seek agreement to publish these then on the website? Okay, agreed. happy enough. Okay, agenda item number three then, matters are rising. Uh, the UK Chancellor's Summer Economic Update Totals. Uh, can I inform members that they received from the Department a note and summary of the UK Chancellor's uh, Summer Economic Update, and that's at page 19, uh, which has been copied to all statutory uh, committees. Members content to move on? Okay. Uh, agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, agenda item number four then is oral evidence, uh, the function of government <coughs> miscellaneous provisions bill. Uh, can I welcome Mr. Jim Alistair, MLA, the bill sponsor, although it's a bit uh, weird inviting you to your own committee, uh, Jim. Can I remind members the agenda item is being recorded by Hansard? And can I inform members the following papers relate to this agenda item? A clerk's brief uh, on page 22 and then possible amendments by uh, Jim on page 27. Uh, a written response by Jim to the committee questions at page 37, and then the response from the Assembly and Executive Review Committee on page 54. Uh, so if members are content, uh, can I invite uh, Jim then to make an opening statement? Well, thank you very much. Um, obviously, <coughs> since the bill was launched, I've been listening very carefully to the various points made, um, primarily at the oral sessions and the, the written evidence submitted. And it has been a useful exercise for me in terms of seeking to fine tune and improve the bill. And that is why I've given you sight of a variety of amendments flowing from that process, which I am minded to table. And if I could, without going through them all, just highlight two or three points from that. Uh, I think the amendments 13 to 15 are important in that they recast clauses 6 to 8, which is about record keeping, uh, bring, I think, greater clarity and cohesion to those. Article 14 introduces regulation in regard to lobbying and that is based very much on the 2014 Act on the subject in Great Britain, which I think has worked fairly well. So it would introduce a formal requirements in respect of ministers and special advisors being lobbied. So I think generally six to eight hang better together than they did previously. Um, clauses seven uh, uh, and nine deal with two aspects of criminal offences in the bill, and probably um, that means, uh, sorry, uh, yes, seven and nine. Uh, 
sorry, 911, <laughs> to deal with the criminal offences. My mistake. <coughs> and um, those two causes have probably drawn the most attention. And I've taken significant steps in view of some of the comments made. Uh, the committee will recall that initially I had a defence of simply reasonable excuse. I've taken that and radically reversed the burden of proof in that, so that now the prosecution must disprove reasonable excuse once that is raised, which happens to some other legislation, but is uh, makes things, I think, quite different from what was originally anticipated. I've reduced the tariff in Clause 11 um, from the maximum tariff from five years to two uh, to take account of the fact that it's more reflective of the type of tariff that would be available, for example, though it's a different subject, within the Official Secrets Act. Amendment uh, 20 simplifies Clause 11, uh, and that very much takes account of also the points were raised by some contributors about protecting FOI rights and a point that Matthew too raised about um, not wanting to put any cloud of criminality over a special advisor doing his job in terms of briefing the media. So all of that is taken care of. And then for the committee's consideration, I have provided in light of the discussion that we had, two options in respect to Clause 9. Uh, members will be aware that Clause 9, as originally drafted, uh, made the offence that, that of the um, Minister, Civil Servant or Special Advisor, uh, made the offence that when they were on official business they had to use personal, uh, they were not allowed to use personal accounts or anything other than departmental systems, and that was the offence if they failed to do that. What I've offered in the second um, version of that amendment, something primarily flowing, for, I think, from what you, Vice Chair, said, um, is that the offence, instead of being the using of such non-official material uh, 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 processes, the offence would be failing to record back into the official system that which had been emanating from non-official usage, uh, and therefore that would become <coughs> a criminal offence uh, to create the deterrent of someone trying to hide something. Uh, if they try to hide something and get caught on it, then the offence is that they never put it on the official system. And that, of course, was one of the issues in RHI, uh, that things were hidden away uh, on private processes. Uh, and um, therefore, that's the, that's the choice on the amendments touching upon Clause 9. Do, we, do I keep it as the offence being the actual use of non-official devices? Or do I make the offence the failure to record back into the official system something that has emerge from the use of non-official devices. And in respect of both, uh, of course, the option is to uh, uh, also sustain the reversal and the burden of proof in respect of reasonable excuse. Um, Amendment 12 is a, a new clause, and it really is motivated by my consideration as a member of, a, of committees that we're in a situation where when we ask for something from a department and don't get it, then the only step we can take is the ultimate extreme step of Section 44 of the 98 Act, which requires a very convoluted process. Um, whereas <clears throat> I was somewhat surprised when I looked at it to discover that in this jurisdiction there is no statutory duty on a department to provide information. 
And so a new clause that is in Amendment 12 would say that ministers in the departments must provide to an assembly committee such information as that committee may reasonably require in order to discharge its functions, being information which has been requested in writing and relates to a statutory function exercisable by the minister or the department. So as to create that statutory obligation, in the expectation that that would dissipate any need to have recourse to Section 44, that it should uh, create a freer flow in that regard without having to go to the extremity of Section 44. So, uh, Chair, those, that's just a very quick overview. I, I did give members of the, uh, I did give the clerk at the beginning of July copies of the amendments and my explanation for them, and I believe that was circulated to all members. So I hope members have had the opportunity to digest what was there, but no doubt any questions and we'll seek to deal with. Okay, thank you very much, Jim, uh, for your succinct and concise uh, presentation. Uh, yes, Sean, I'll bring you in. Oh, myself, of course. Just on the last point, uh, Jim, s section 44. Yes. Are you saying that this new amendment clause 12 will do away with? No. Or it won't? What will be the relationship between both? Well, well each are freestanding. Um, section 44 is the ultimate step when a committee gets into conflict with a department that they're not getting what they want. They can effectively take steps which are almost like judicial steps, like high court steps, to compel. Um, whereas to discourage getting to that point, because that's a very time consuming process, uh, where you have to take advices and all sorts of things, I thought it would be useful to introduce a statutory duty on committees. Uh, on ministers and departments to actually produce documents when asked, uh, because at this moment there isn't strangely that duty, and I would have thought that duty should exist. So the new clause that's in Amendment 12 would be to encourage that process, not taking away Section 44, um, but probably having the effect of meaning that recourse to it would be less and less necessary. So they're, they're free, each are different but freestanding in their operation. Um, just a, uh, another point, of which would take primacy? And, and just another question, Chair. In terms of Clause 11 around whistleblowing, blowers, um, you have said that in terms of the public interest, Yes. Um, this would leave open the argument who and how is the public interest determined? Yeah. But just the, on the first point, Jim, uh, on the primacy of your Amendment 12 on Section 44. Well, it's not a competition in terms of primacy. They each have their own place. Uh, the Amendment 12 would create a statutory duty on the Department to supply information. 44 then only comes into play if they fail in that. Then you still have the final step of 44. The idea of Amendment 12 is to encourage departments uh, to be as forthcoming as they can without forcing anyone to go to Section 44. So I think it would aid smooth running uh, more than anything else, but it's freestanding. Uh, the point about a... Clause 11 is that um, without prejudice, it says, to the operation of the Official Secrets Act and saving the discharge of a statutory obligation, what that means there probably is FOI, or in the lawful pursuit of official duties. And that's the SPAD briefing the press as part of his duties. Uh, it shall be an offence for any minister, civil servant, or special advisor to communicate directly or indirectly official information to another for the financial or other improper benefit. Improper comes from the submission of the Human Rights Commission uh, of any person or third party. In proceedings in respect of a charge against a person of the offence under subsection 1, it is a offence 
for A, to, pr to show that the course of behaviour was reasonable in the particular circumstances or was in the public interest. Well, that could cover the whistleblower. And that's really what, in my mind, that's directed at. If you have a situation within a department and something bad is going on, but nobody is prepared to put their head above the parapet uh, and expose it, and then along comes a whistleblower who does what it says in 11.1 they shouldn't do, namely give out information, it would be a defence for them to say, well, it was very much in the public interest that I acted as a whistleblower. Uh, and that's what uh, the public interest, in my mind, would be covering in that regard. Uh, and then if they raise that, it's for the prosecution to disprove that it was in the public interest, uh, because that's a reasonable excuse. So I hope that answers the question, but that's, that's what I have in mind about the public interest. It could be probably, wider than that. Yeah, um, probably, probably raises other questions, but anyhow, Chair, that's, that's me. Okay, any other members at this point? Uh, Jim? Well, first of all, Mr. Alcer, thank you for uh, giving the committee the courtesy of uh, tabling the amendments since it's a long time ago. I wish other uh, movers of various legislation would follow the same uh, lead, which has given us plenty of time to consider them. I want to just go into the mechanics of, let's take a situation, a SPAD is in the Maldives, for instance, with his minister. Uh, he, cannot use, he cannot use the equipment that's been provided by the department. He's forced to use his personal mobile uh, to make communication back to um, his private office. Yes. What is the mechanics of him then transferring that back into the official system? What would he actually do, or she actually do? Well, first of all, uh, he can use his private, he or she can use the private facilities out of necessity. That's the phrase in, in the amendment. Uh, if, if out of necessity it's not possible to comply, uh, then uh, within 48 hours or as soon thereafter as practical, they must copy to the departmental system any material generated during the use of the non-departmental uh, equipment and they must make an accurate record on the departmental system of any verbal communications relating to the department. So the mechanics of that might be they might send an email to the private office, I would have thought, saying, please enter this on the um, departmental system. Uh, I wish to record this information. Or they might, when they're back, do it themselves. But the necessity and the mischief that this is directed at is that things aren't done behind backs, off official systems, never to be seen. Uh, the onus is then on the person who steps outside to use the non-official systems to make sure that that uh, information generated there comes on to the official system. So that when Joe Public makes an FOI application or an assembly member asks a question uh, and the official system is searched, the information's there. But would he or she be required to make it clear that this was information that is being logged as being uh, perhaps using a personal mobile phone, would they have to actually point out the fact that it wasn't possible at the time, or would this go into the system as if it, it had been done on, uh, as properly? No, it would be... The onus is on him to get it onto the official system. I don't think... Well, probably by way of explanation, you'd expect them to say this is information that came from my private system. But the offence as drafted is the failure to uh, put it onto the official system. How, how they do that is not specified because there might be different processes in different departments and processes might change over time. You know, it might be a LinkedIn 
document could simply automatically be transferred. Uh, uh, so the offence is the failure to get it onto the official system. But for instance, I remember being caught in Tanzania for 10 days. Yeah. Um, I couldn't simply, could not get back to the office. I was in areas where there was no yeah. internet or anything like that. Uh, all I could use was my mobile phone. It would be reasonable at the end of the 10 days and return to the UK to then to log that material. Yes, because it says within 48 hours or as soon thereafter as reasonably practical. Yeah. So you're stuck in the jungle somewhere and can't get back yeah. for 10 days. But when you get back, then the obligation on you is to get it on the system. Second question is on the issue of the requirement of departments to give up evidence and material. Um, does that sit easily with the, the overall nature of the bill? I'm always reminded of the famous Henry VIII shipping bill, which ran to 500 pages, and at the end, I said, I hereby divorce Anne Boleyn. In other words, it was stuck in, it stuck in something that really wasn't relevant to the, to the main purpose of the bill. Well, I, I think it's very relevant, because even the title of the bill is the functioning of government. And the long title is... Uh, to do various things and to make additional provision for the function of government in Northern Ireland and connected purposes. But the function of government and connected purposes very clearly, uh, I believe, would cover the functioning of committees, V of E departments, and this is to step up the expectation and the enforceability of a committee's expectation about being serviced by the department with the information it seeks. But the main so I think that's totally germane to the functions of the uh, to but, the purposes of the bill. But the main thrust of the bill is to bring Maverick Spads under control, uh, based on the experience of the RHI. Well, it's not just that. Like, uh, the, there are things in this bill which uh, do more than that. But uh, any amendment has to fit within the long title, and uh, certainly the bills office haven't suggested to me that that wouldn't fit within the long title. I think it does touch on the functioning of government because it's touching on the relationship between departments and committees, and the committees are a key part of the infrastructure in terms of scrutiny. So, so for future reference, we must make our title of the bill as vague and all-encompassing as possible. You so must make your long title as, 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 as all-encompassing as possible. So you can bring anything underneath that, that uh, well, if it umbrella. fits within the long title. Interesting. You learn something every day. Thank you. Ah. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Alistair. Um, there was a lot of work. I don't think you could have had many days off if, from all the reading that I've had to do on that. There. Uh, I was going to ask you on Clause 4, um, yes. just the date. It's only a small question to start with, but you think with COVID-19 that the date of the 31st of March is still adequate in order to, to, to have your bill? Um, as proposed, uh, the bill sponsors said that the, for the 31st, is it adequate time for the adjustments as they're coming in? I think it is. Now, it's a date, obviously, that was chosen by me uh, when I first introduced the bill. And yes, COVID has come along, and yes, um, that has delayed things. Uh, the position I'd take on that is if and when this bill gets to further consideration stage and a view is collectively taken that it's getting too tight to the 31st of March, then it would be a very simple amendment, a further consideration stage to advance that. There has been a view expressed, I can't remember exactly where it came from, maybe the executive office, that it would be better to coincide that with the end of the mandate. There is a certain logic to that, but if things are ready with time in advance of that, I didn't really see the need to add an extra year to it. And of course, you're, who knows, the mandate could even be extended. Mm. Um, so I would have thought if legislation gives adequate time, and really what you're talking about is for the executive office, if everything here went through, the executive office to adjust its number of SPADs, uh, for codes of conduct to be adjusted in respect of um, various additions. Uh, none of that is excessively protracted. So I would have thought, you know, even if, if this bill got royal assent before Christmas, 
Um, a full three months thereafter is adequate time, but if the House ultimately thinks otherwise, I'll not die in a ditch over it. Thanks. And uh, how can Clause 5, how concerned are you at the, petition, the petition of concern uh, for the passage of this bill? That won't be you. Well, a petition of concern can be used on any bill after the second reading. I think there was material in New Decade New Approach which was discouraging of that, but it could be used. Uh, but that would require, of course, the components to be met, namely 30 mm -hmm. people. And have you thought of other ways of the, to, to try to prevent it? Is there some well, other ways that we could... One of the things I wanted to do in this bill, I did want to amend Clause 5 in relation to the reports that come back from the Standards Committee so that they couldn't be petitioned off. They couldn't be petitioned with a petition of concern uh, because... That was to take the partisanship out of it, where uh, one of the bigger parties, in order to protect one of their own, despite the overwhelming nature, perhaps, of the evidence found by the Standards Commissioner, nonetheless blocks uh, the findings of the report. But I, in discussion with the legal services, they were quite adamant that the petition of concern aspect is a, a matter reserved in the 98 Act that the Assembly cannot change and would take amendment to the 98 Act to change that. Uh, so uh, I had to reduce my ambitions in that direction and therefore there isn't any inhibition on the petition of concern in this bill. Thanks. And so I think New Decade, your approach did promise there would be some changes the, and that yes. must be going to have to come in legislation in Westminster. And on 5A, uh, will this clause make it easier for the committees? To, I know you've already stated it at the start, but um, I mean, are you fairly confident that what you have said there would be able to be seen through on, on how we could get that information? Well, th I think it gives the committee another string to its bow. Right, you know, I yes. think it, it very much, uh, if you can point to a statutory provision that says we're entitled to this, yeah. well, then it's bound to make a department more dilatory about refusing it to you. Okay. Um, uh, just going back, uh, uh, going forward into Clause 9, and uh, given the evidence is a criminal offence required, and if so, how do you integrate the criminal offence with the internal uh, disciplinary procedures? Can you well, the, I think generally when there is any criminal investigation, uh, internal procedures tend to be parked, to allow the criminal proceedings to come to a conclusion. So that would be the interface, I think, on that. Um, it was suggested by some that it's enough to put all that sort of stuff in the codes. My response to that has always been, yeah, but those sort of things were in the codes, and RHI demonstrated just how useless that was. Uh, and really, the choice for every MLA post RHI is do we want the changes that are made to be binding or not? And if we want them to be binding, they have to be in legislation. Because as I've quoted several times, Lord Bingham has made it very clear that a code's just that, just a code. code. It's not legislation. And I suppose um, with all your experiences say at, at, at the bar, uh, looking at the legislation, are these offences clearly defined? I believe so. Um, the Section 9 offence, uh, depending on which version, it's either, uh, and I would be interested to get a feel from the committee on the two versions, it's either the initial uh, use of a non-official system that's the offence, or it's the failure, having used a non-official system, to put it onto the official system. Uh, either of those, I think, are pretty clear. Um, so uh, it would help me if I, if I had some feedback from the committee as to which of those uh, was in the view of the committee preferable. Okay. okay. Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> James, thank you for your statement as well too. 
Uh, just on the very last point that you made there about why not as binding, I think there are more recent experience of what happened in Westminster only yesterday it shows us that uh, when it comes to legislation, how binding it can be, uh, or how it can be ignored if it went to that as well, too, depending entirely on the culture. And I've always felt that inherent in the RHI uh, inquiry in that as well, too, it was the culture that had to be addressed more than um, the codes of practice in itself. But notwithstanding all of that, uh, if I move on to uh, an area that seems to maybe give rise to uh, more questions than other areas within the bill, uh, i.e. Clause 11, uh, in your amendment, uh, you've changed the wording, uh, so it now says, saving discharge of a statutory obligation or in the lawful pursuit of official duties, it shall be an offence. Um, and I have some concerns about that. Like Sam McBride, amongst others, raised the potential issue of ministers or spads briefing journalists uh, on government bu bu business uh, being in breach of legislation and facing criminal prosecutions. Now, how does this new, word, new wording prevent this from happening? Well, I, I think I've already alluded to that. What it says is, without prejudice to the operation of the Official Secrets Act, and save in the discharge of a statutory obligation, I think that's FOI, where you have to give information. Save in the discharge of the statutory obligation or in the lawful pursuit of official duties. So if it's part of the official duties of a SPAD, to brief a policy proposal on behalf of his minister to the media, then that's done in pursuit of official duties. Therefore, that would not be an offence. So that's to take care of the Sam McBride point. That's why the wording has been changed to put that in. Uh, so it still catches the unauthorised um, disclosure of, inform of official information for improper purposes, but it would not catch the uh, briefings that Sam McBride referred to, it, it, because that would be a lawful pursuit of official duties. So that point's taken care of. Well, currently it's not included, we'll say, uh, in terms of statutory obligation or official duties um, uh, of a SPAD to include speaking to members of the media. Well, that, that could be changed at very swiftly in terms of the um, terms and conditions and codes. So uh, it's not for me to write the codes. Yeah. But you do uh, accept that's not included at present? Well, I don't, actually, uh, I don't actually know if that's true, but I would have thought custom and practice is that special advisers can and do brief the media. Uh, if it needs amplification in the um, codes of conduct, well then, no doubt, that can be done. Yeah. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that the media in themselves are another essential uh, element of democracy in every respect, and that the way that they should be in a position there uh, to uh, question um, uh, and uh, to avail of uh, the services of the SPAD uh, in terms of proper scrutiny of, we'll say, government policy and the likes of it. So that if it isn't included, uh, uh, it's a danger in itself. If it isn't included, then I think you need to ask the question, why is it not included? Yeah, I do think so. And then in relation to that, you see that whenever we talk then about um, uh, when an offence has been committed, yes. uh, in your amendment, you've reduced the penalty for conviction from five years to two. Yes. Uh, now, the Human Rights Commission, in their evidence, stressed the importance of proportionality. Now, this proposed amendment doesn't address the problems of proportionality. Well, I think clear view, well, sorry, just as the clear view of the Human Rights Commission that creating a specific set of criminal offences is neither necessary nor proportionate. So clearly, uh, I'm of the opinion that uh, the view of the Human Rights Commission should hold some weight in this debate. And I do remember very, very clearly their evidence as presented to this committee. Uh, they're experts that are tasked with ensuring that our laws and regulations are compliant with international human rights standards, and, and I think that that should be taken on board here as well, too. Well, I would have to comment. Human Rights Commission are not the legislators for Northern Ireland. The legislators for Northern Ireland are the Northern, is the Northern Ireland Assembly, 
and we're grateful to the views expressed by the Human Rights Commission, but it's for us as the MLAs and the legislators to determine the legislation. Uh, I did take account of the points that were made, and that's reflected in the reduction in maximum tariff. There was a point made by some that uh, it should only be summary offences, that there shouldn't be um, anything above the summary. The reason for making it a hybrid offence, that's to say an offence which can be tried either in the magistrate's court or in the crime court, the reason for making it a hybrid offence is if you make it only a magistrate's court offence, then the accused does not have the right to jury trial. By making it a hybrid offence, you convey a right on the accused to say, no, I want to opt for this to go to the Crown Court. I want to be tried by 12 of my peers. Uh, so I think there is a protection for the individual accused in keeping it a hybrid offence, uh, which wouldn't be there if you made it only a summary offence. Well, uh, and, and, and I do think as well too that I'm sure you remember like that uh, uh, in their evidence, uh, the Human Rights uh, Commission representative had actually said that uh, one can achieve the objectives uh, using any one of the two methods and it's dependent entirely uh, on which one it is that one would sort of uh, decide on whether it was to be legislation or the code of practice. Uh, and given that this has arisen out of the RHA inquiry in particular, now, the RHA inquiry in itself, it hasn't uh, included any recommendations uh, to the executive uh, that it should be anything other than, we'll say, a code of practice. And that is it not the case that as the minister had initially come forward with a code of practice, we should await uh, the further outcome of that uh, and of the RHA inquiry. I don't understand why people would want to postpone bringing certainty to these matters. I do remind you that the RHI inquiry had quite a lot to say about the failure of the old codes. The old codes did require integrity and honesty and non-disclosure of information. Uh, Paragraph 24 of Schedule 1 of the Old Code uh, established high standards of confidentiality. Did it work? No. RHI proves abundantly that the codes, uh, having something in the codes, uh, was of no effect. Uh, so with that experience of the failure of codes, the choice is now, do we put our faith in something that's already failed, or do we put our faith in something binding, like legislation? And I really don't see uh, why anyone who has nothing to fear from uh, a prohibition on breaching confidentiality, why anyone would balk at it being in legislation. I've already made the point. The choice for MLAs, do we want the changes proved necessary by RHI to be binding or not. If we want them to be binding, then we need to put them in legislation. Codes are a failed vehicle, and that has been demonstrated beyond belief. And if there are people in the storm and bubble who think that we can rectify all this by simply rewriting the codes, then I think they are in a bubble. I think the public expectation is that being scandalised by what happened in RHI, that we need better than codes and the better than codes is legislation. Whilst I totally respect your opinion, um, uh, um, I, I have to say that I totally disagree with it as, as well, uh, that uh, it isn't the code per se was the problem, and I keep making the point that it was a culture. And uh, if that same culture prevails, irrespective of whether or not it's code or legislation, then we still are faced with a very, very serious problem, and that is what it is that has to change in every respect. And I don't think that, the, that having uh, convictions uh, or jail terms uh, for what might be seen as breaches of um, 
a, a code or legislation per se in itself is going to drive um, uh, any real change within this assembly or anywhere else? Well, it's a matter of judgment. My judgment is, given the experience of the past, that culture, that culture that you referred to, will be more influenced and changed by the deterrence of legislation by, than by the repetition of limp codes. And I think that is the choice. It's do you want the change to be binding? Or do you want it to be transitory that can be tra trashed again as it was in the past? And I don't understand why anyone, if they're uh, genuinely wanting to improve the culture of operation, would uh, balk at legislation setting it out very plain and very straight so if anyone does breach it, it's not a matter of a slap on the wrist under a code, uh, which probably wouldn't even happen because the, the disciplinarian is the very person who appointed the person in the first place. Whether they want that or they want the deterrent of legislation, that's the choice the Assembly has to make. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Gemma, are you wanting to come in or are you okay at this point? You're okay at this point. Okay, thank you. Jim, can I ask you, uh, uh, not to disrespect, and then I'll close your bill, I'll take you to a lesser, what I feel is a lesser point uh, with regard to your, one of your clauses, and that's clause 12, the biannual reporting. Mm. Uh, now, I think we've had evidence to suggest from both uh, Finance and Executive Office that the provisions of clause 12, as they stand, duplicate what already happens in annual reports and accounts. Uh, what, would, what, would, what would stop... If this was to become law, what would stop the departments adding a paragraph onto the annual reports and accounts? And if so, is that acceptable to you, or should this be a standalone report? No, uh, I think it's not an either or. I think each individual body, from time to time, make usually annual reports. They make recommendations. The purpose of Clause 12 is to make sure that those reports don't gather dust that there is an overview taken every two years what has been recommended that we need to act on mm -hmm. might already have been acted on good but if it's been hasn't been acted on or a judicial review has thrown up a point that needs to be addressed then the idea of the assembly the executive first of all and the assembly every two years focusing on those issues can only be a good idea otherwise reports we all know it tend to gather dust. Maybe with the best intentions we will do that, but we never get round to it. But if we have a compulsion that every two years we'll have a biannual report on uh, things that need, can be done, that have been recommended or arise from judicial reviews that could improve the function of government, then that keeps a focus on it. And that's, that's all the 12 do, Clause 12 does. And I think it's important, but I, I don't see why there'd be any resistance to that. Can I just read then into the record, just uh, for by way of explanation for me, uh, the last line of uh, first paragraph of 12, and having considered any relevant judgments of the courts on governmental administration and actions, do, do you mean by that any court judgment on governance, or do you mean specifically the offences that we create in this bill? No, I mean any, any, any comments most likely to be out of a judicial review yeah. about uh, pertaining to uh, the functioning of government. Uh, uh, in fact, the Amendment 21 says that I want to make it more explicit by saying judgments of the courts relevant to the functioning of government. Yep. So 21 perhaps tidies up that ambiguity. Yeah. Yeah. And that is most likely, in my experience, to be a judicial review judgment, but it wouldn't of necessity be a judicial review judgment. Let's say there was a prosecution under sections, what would be sections 9 or 11, and a judge made a comment, I don't understand why that's as it is, or that could be better, etc. That's something you might want to take account of. But most often, it would be, by their very nature, judicial reviews are a challenging process. It would be very, by, 
by the very nature it's most likely to be judicial review judgments that would uh, criticise the functioning and processes of government. So yes, those you'd be looking at. And um, 12B then, I don't think it's I don't think you do violence to that by your amendment, but it says bring forward by statutory provision or other means as appropriate proposals to improve the functioning of government. What, what do you mean by other means? Uh, I, I take it when you say statutory provision, you mean law? Yes, the statutory provision can be an act of parliament or it can be secondary legislation. Uh, and then other means, well, be codes? It might, it might be a code change. It might be simply a ministerial declaration of how we're going to do things. Um, it could be anything within the ambit, uh, a policy declaration. It could be all those things. Okay. Uh, on, the, on the clause, the new clause, mm. uh, with regards to uh, a statutory footing uh, for a uh, provision, provision of information coming down to a committee, uh, I must say... I like the idea of this uh, because I do believe that using Section 44 is too unwieldy and it's too cumbersome and slow uh, because you're having to threaten that in order to try and get something, whereas if it was in a statutory footing that there was an expectation and, in fact, it was law that uh, anything the committee would request in writing that we would receive. I, I don't understand why... There is a gap like this. Uh, if you, you either have a scrutiny committee or you do not, mm. and if you have a scrutiny committee doing its job well, you need to give it the sufficient power. Mm. Uh, but the wording of new clause 5A, uh, what, what does that look like in comparison to section 44 of the 98 Act? Is it, is it couched in the same terminology, or is it... You, you talked no, about... No, it's, it's, uh, it's in sight... It's in different terminology because they're serving two different purposes, I suppose. Um, uh, just let me get you the exact terminology. 44. Like 44 is very much the um, sort of sanction provision. Yes. Uh, Let's take a moment open. Because it's the power to call witnesses and documents, mm -hmm. and to subpoena, as it were, documents. Yep. Uh, that's still a power you would have, but I think it would be less likely to have the need to have recourse to it if there's a statutory obligation to supply the documents in the first place. So, and I, I agree with you on that point uh, in a personal capacity, but. What is the point of having a statutory obligation with no sanction? So what I'm basically getting to is, do we need to add an offence or a sanction to your bill on new clause 5A to compel? Because no. if, if ministers, permanent secretaries and officials behave badly and obstruct information flow, what, what will having it in, in law, and I, and I agree with you, I think we need it, but without a sanction... To compel. Well, I think the sanction, if my new clause 5A doesn't work in a situation, then you go to 44. Mm -hmm. 44 is the one with the sanctions. Yes. So I think there's a linkage in that sense. Right, okay. So, uh, yeah, 5A doesn't work, then 44 is your last resort where there is sanction. Not that, from no sanction, but there is sanction. Well, there's sanction of contempt. And yeah. And would that strengthen the fact that you would have this clause in a separate piece of legislation or a new piece of legislation? Yeah. Do you think that would strengthen your case at court oh, or inspection so. 44? I think very much so. Like you're going then to, um, to compel the production of something that's been refused in the face of a statute provision that prima facie it should be provided. Yeah, I think it, it very much strengthens the path to 44. On one of your big ones, which is uh, clause nine, yeah, uh, and you did ask and request for a steer. Yes. Uh, my personal opinion is that I like the idea of your section option, your second option, 
With yeah. regards to the use of official systems in that the, the offence would be the non-declaration, uh, the non-declaring of the fact that you've used the official systems. And why I like that is is because I've, I've talked about it in this room before about quite quite often you would you would mistakenly use a wrong account. Now, you could guard against that by having a completely separate system, uh, a separate laptop, a separate phone for your business, for your department, <coughs> and all of that that would guard against that. But ultimately then, the fact that you could make a mistake that would be would mean that you've created an offence or, or, or uh, conducted something unlawfully. The fact that you have done that, and it is wrong to have used a private account or, or something else, the fact then that the defence is actually when you don't declare that. So if it was completely innocent mm. and you have declared it, nothing is wrong. Mm. Um, at that point, you haven't broken the law, uh, so to speak. And, and it's nearly given you a, a second chance, if you know what I mean, to declare it. So you've done the first action, which is used in an official system or a device uh, or an email, a personal email, a private email, and then you've declared it. And, and I think... I, I, I'm much more comfortable with that. Now, I also note that you add in your amendments that you've added in, in both the offences, uh, the, the aspect of the public interest. Mm -hmm. And I think, to me, that's very important too. Uh, because you imagine, you imagine if, if you were a whistleblower and something seriously bad, wrong was going on in that department, mm -hmm. you had privy... You have, you have information on that and you needed to get that out in the public interest. You would use a private account to get that out. Mm. So you really need the public interest in both offences because you could, you could, you could have a, a public interest defence in one, but by the fact that you've used an unofficial mm. email, mm. You could fall foul to the other offence. No, I've become persuaded of all that. and It started with your initial observations about that some months yeah. ago, uh, and then supplemented by what some other people think. I think the public interest is now a, a very important component of this. Um, I'm reasonably relaxed as to whether it's the first or second version of Clause 9. Uh, I understand the logic that you're propounding that the real offending is, and the real concealment is the non-transfer. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, if that's if that's without prejudice to people's general views about the bill, if that's the consensus view of the committee, then I'm happy to to table the second amendment. Well, I'm not sure. Steering that would be helpful. I'm not sure of that because other members haven't declared, but maybe uh, maybe that's not necessarily today, but it would be helpful. On that yeah, I was hoping that we could maybe set that aside. And maybe just as a special, uh, maybe one-off, to, to try to, to come to an understanding and an agreement. And, and my reasons for was not to dwell on it today, but if that wasn't accepted and, and if, if it wasn't agreed to, um, the function of the government, which is updated following, uh, so just bear with me, uh, the bill sponsor further on this point in order to determine specific differences between what is proposed under Clause 12 and what is already in place. It's not much. It's just a few questions around what we already have in place. That's Clause 12. Yes, that's, that's that Clause 11 I wanted to go to. It was um, the committee were to decide not to support Clause 11. What changes would the bill sponsor yourself recommend to the current codes, guidance and disciplinary procedures to ensure those who disclose information without the authority to do so are constantly held accountable. So they're interlinked. That's really the point we're trying I to make. I think there. that point's been made about 9 yes. and 11. Yes. But well, my answer to that is I've already declared I think codes don't cut the mustard. Yes, and so, I'm in uh, agreement with you. So uh, my, my view is that it requires legislation yes. and therefore... Um, you know, if we don't want to bite the bullet and go for legislation, I don't think we serve any purpose. That's right. Well, that's okay. I've already stated I am in agreement with you, but I'd like you know, to the point, could, Chair, time off. about whether or not option A or option B on clause nine is the better 
uh, if there's a view about that, without prejudice to what people think generally about the bill. My, my personal view now, and giving it to you here, is B. Uh, is, is B but again, members members can make up their own mind. If if if, if they haven't come to a thought conclusion on that, then certainly. If we can get that to the bill sponsor as quickly as possible, I think it will be quite helpful moving on. And we will get to a point in this committee where we're going through this informally. Could we do that clause. sooner rather than later, Chair? Yep. I yep. mean, I'm yeah. quite happy. I mean, I'm fairly close to it now, but it's just a few yeah. tactical points I want yeah, to sure. look at on them. But if I, that's I think, right, I think the sooner rather than sponsor as well. Oh, yeah. Because we will, we will have to unofficially, first of all, um, go through clause yeah. by clause and, and give, her, give an account on it. So. Yeah, probably the sooner that gets nailed down, the better. One further question, Jim, and that's me. Um, it was a point Pat raised around the SPADs, um, the changes in the SPAD numbers by, timings. by the timings by the 31st of March 2021. I take it that's just simply the date because of a new financial year? Yes. So, um, and you can understand how changing that date to any other date in the year could be prob problematic, but ultimately, a mandate, can, an election can come at any time too, but there is this reasonable assumption that a SPAD will be in place and there's no guarantees after the next election, mm. you know, that type of thing. So on that, a new mandate, whilst you're quite right with regards to the timing of a new mandate, when, when, when an assembly would, be, uh, would fall and another assembly would take place, and that could actually even be before that date, the 31st of March. So, but but there's there's more seems to be a more of a natural cut off with regards to a mandate rather than a. But I understand also the end of a financial year too. Um, but I agree with Pat. The timing could be getting close to enough well, for for people to make what is life changing decisions uh, with regards to their their job. Uh, so it's, well, uh, the view I expressed was that. Maybe don't have to be definitive about that till you get to this, yeah, yeah. the um, further consideration stage. Yep. Okay, any further questions, members? Or are we content to leave it uh, at that for now? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. So, are you happy for me to continue to sit here? Since we're yeah, I don't think there's any other. Okay. No, you can sit. Yep. Sit there. Uh, uh, sure, just through the chair, just on those couple of points uh, with the sponsor. Uh, it would be possible. Would it be possible for myself, maybe, just to meet with you for? Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. Okay. Uh, there, there are. There was. Jim had. Uh, the clerk had uh, raised a number of questions. Now, I think we did cover a good lot of them in our own ways, in our own speech. But uh, if there are any other outstanding questions from that brief, it's a brief that you probably have, Jim, and from it you, was, anyway, yeah. yes. So you, you could preempt these questions. Uh, but cheating. Uh, That's cheating. Cheating. Uh, if, if there is any that have been uh, not answered or unanswered, then we can maybe follow up on them just to give us a complete picture. Yeah. Uh, they do replicate a number of points in the 68 questions, I think it was. That yes, I, absolutely. Yep. Uh, Why would we waste some of the summer with? Yes. So are members content then that we, we write to Jim seeking responses to the questions that have not been out, uh, answered? Uh, that's okay. Well, and then also, uh, can I inform members that the, the bill clerk will be invited to attend a future meeting to brief the committee on the next steps of the passage of this bill? Sorry, who's going to brief? Uh, that the bill clerk oh, right. will be invited to come along to brief uh, the the committee on just probably the process of legislation. Well, 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 could, could I just make one point? Mm -hmm. um, like I think we're fast coming to the point where. People, if they haven't already, are going to make up their minds about all these issues. So I don't see any point in protracting that. Uh, I would like to see us have those meetings that we require to do that, because uh, I do want to give, bring this back to the floor of the House as soon as. Um, I, I suspect that that uh, meeting with the bill clerk will be to 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 allow members. Time to question in case they wanted to bring in any form or any any more amendments, and at least the bill clerk will be able to advise individual members of that. We had one similar in last week in the justice committee uh, about the bill there. So probably, if I'm right, that's basically what it will be. So could that be next week then? 
I'm not done. We're just trying to schedule that in, yeah. but more than likely it'll be next week. Yeah, it should be it should be sooner rather than later because if there are anybody looking and thinking, considering amendments, then it's we need to get that sorted too quickly. Could, could I selfishly ask that be pushed down the agenda next week? Because I'm in the audit committee and it's meeting at one o'clock, or unless it was first business, I suppose. Okay, we'll try and try and arrange. We're around that. Right Try and manage that. Okay, members, uh, moving on then, if everybody's okay. Jim, you're all right there in your okay, place. Thanks. Uh, number five then, and item number five, it's SR 2020 slash 144, the rates, coronavirus emergency relief number two regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Can I draw mem uh, attention to the clerk's note on page 66 and the subordinate legislation on page 68? Can I inform members the purpose of this statutory rule is to make provision to provide emergency rate relief in order to help business rate payers who are facing financial impacts arising from the serious public health issues caused by the virus known as coronavirus. The rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. Uh, it is uh, proposed that the rule will come into operation as soon as possible in order to address ongoing issues facing businesses as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak. This will breach the 21-day rule, which the Department informed the Committee of the likelihood in the SL1. Can I remind members the Committee considered the SL1 at its meeting on the 24th of June 2020 and was content with the policy proposals. There have been no changes in policy content since the SL1. Uh, in the 19th report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, tabled at page 2, it is content that the Department has provided a satisfactory explanation for the breach of the 21-day rule on this occasion. Can I ask members for any comments, if there are any? If there are no comments, can I seek agreement then that the Committee for Finance has considered SR 2020-144, the rates coronavirus and emergency relief number 2 regulations in Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objections to the rule? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, agenda item number six then, uh, SR 2020 160. The rates automatic telling machines, designation of rural areas order, Northern Ireland 2020. Can I draw attention to the clerk's note at page 80 and the subordinate legislation at 81? Can I inform members the purpose of this draft rule is to update the eligible wards following the previous rule in 2016 for the purpose of providing a rates exemption to automatic telling machines in these areas. The rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. I remind members that the Committee considered this SL1, uh, SL1 for this order at its meeting on 24th of June and was content with the policy proposals. There have been no changes in policy content since SL1. Uh, and again, the examiner of statutory rules uh, tabled at page 2 does not draw any special attention to the Assembly of the Assembly to this SR. Can I ask members for any comments? If there are no comments, can I seek agreement then that the Please. Committee for Finance has considered SL 2020-160 and has no objections to the rule? Agreed? Agreed. Uh, agenda item number seven then, SR 2020-161, the Valuation Telecommunications, Natural Gas and Water Amendments Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. Can I draw members' attention to the clerk's note at pages 91 and the subordinate legislation at 92. Can I inform members that regulations amend the schedule to the principal regulations to provide an update of the telecommunications companies laid out in part one of the schedule to the principal regulations. The rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure of the Assembly. Can I remind members the committee considered the SL1 at its meeting on the 24th of June and was content with the policy proposals. As there have been no changes to the policy content since SL1 was submitted to the committee and the examiner of statutory rules tabled at page 2 does not draw any special attention to the assembly, uh, of the assembly to this SR, can I ask members for any comments? If there are no comments, can I seek agreement that the Committee for Finance has considered SR 2020-161, the valuation to look communications, natural gas and water amendment regulations in Northern Ireland 2020 and has no objections to the rule. Agreed. Can I then move to agenda item number eight, which is a consultation. Uh, the public service pension schemes, uh, changes to the transitional arrangements to the 2015 schemes. Uh, can I inform members the clerk's brief is at page 98 and the consultation is at page 100. Can I ask members for any comments? Sure. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, just on that, 
This is a consultation on, uh, um, to revert the 2015 pension scheme uh, of the new arrangement was found to be discriminatory. Um, can you tell me, does the Department know how many people this will negatively impact on how this can be mitigated against? I think it was just a letter to them. Well, well, we can seek agreement to receive oral evidence. Sorry. Yeah, yes, could I, could I, uh, this is a huge issue. Yes. Um, which affects everyone who was in a final salary scheme in the public sector in 2015. Just to give you an example, even to make right uh, the effect, it's dormant, it's £2 million, pounds, just, just this building. So therefore, it, it, it has huge implications. The government have put out, it's all based on the McLeod judgment, uh, the government have put out a consultation paper, which was sent to all of us as MLAs, it's, it's very detailed. Um, I think this issue will dominate this committee uh, for months ahead. Uh, not, only, not only the fact that the, the court judge has been very clear that younger members of pension schemes were discriminated against, often women as well, because they were a higher proportion of those affected, but also how you then rectify the damage done. Because for some pensioners, it's actually to their advantage to go in t to, to remain in the new scheme. But for many others, they would wish to revert back to the old final salary scheme. Uh, we have a huge interest to declare here in this building because we are all members of a final salary scheme, whether as MLAs or employees. So therefore, uh, we have to be a bit careful here as to, as to what we do. Uh, 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 just do we have a, 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 and also as on the commission? Well, I'm not on commission. I wish I was. But right, you but mean on the Assembly Commission? Yes. Well, the Assembly Commission uh, will be implementing eventually yeah. what is decided for those members who were taken out of the final salary scheme, both in terms of staff and in terms of MLAs. So everybody in this building is involved okay. in this. Um, no, sorry, Jim. I thought you were finished. Sorry. No, just, just to say that I would welcome a briefing. We had an excellent briefing on it before the government's consultation paper by a lady, I can't remember her name from Pensions Branch, who was extremely articulate. It would be very good to have her back again to see what her current thinking is on, on this hugely important document that's just been published. Okay, our members agreed then Indeed. for an oral Indeed. evidence session. Uh, can I seek agreement also to forward the details of the consultation to the committees for education, health and justice for their information also? Okay, moving on then, members. Uh, agenda number nine is again another consultation amending the building regulations, Northern Ireland 2012. Can I inform members as, as to introduce a ban on combustible materials on external walls of certain building types and make uh, reference to updated maps uh, for radon. That's page 105. The Department has policy responsibility for maintaining the building regulations. Uh, are members, any comments from members? If, if not, can I seek agreement to ask the Department to provide a summary of the consultation responses once the consultation has completed? Agreed. I inform members then at page 457, uh, MW Advocate have written regarding the proposed consultation on amending the building regulations. Uh, can I seek agreement to respond to this correspondence, informing MW that the Assembly Committees do not respond to departmental consultations, but the Committee will consider the matter in full once the consultation has completed and the Committee has had an opportunity to consider the outcome of the consultation including the responses. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay. Uh, item number 10 then is Chairperson's Business. I have no Chairperson's Business at present. Uh, moving on then, uh, Forward Work Programme. Sorry, no, sorry, Correspondence. Uh, item 11. Uh, the Clerk's uh, Briefing uh, Funding Allocation Summer Economics I'm just wondering, Keith, do we have to go through all of this? Is there? There was a, a number of items of correspondence in the chair's brief we've outlined, and in the clerk's brief, it's outlined a number that you might want to. Right. Okay. Discuss, so, but there's a number that are just down for noting. Right. Okay. They are, but um, the ones that are outlined are the ones that are highlighted in the, okay. in the clerk's brief. Members, this is our first meeting back from recess, so if you can bear with me uh, on this, and we'll go through uh, it. And again, stop me at any time if you want to. Uh, comment on any of these. Uh, I'll ask you to stay with me if you can. Uh, so correspondence then, uh, Clerk's Briefing, the Funding Allocation Summer Economic Statement, COVID-19 at pages 465. Can I ask members uh, 
if you want to have any commentary on that. Or are we content? Just very glad we're in the United Kingdom. <laughs> okay. Moving on. Uh, can I seek agreement to forward the tables of COVID allocations for information to each scrutiny committee for their consideration? Agreed. Uh, from department regarding coronavirus, the three billion from the, the NHS, page 469, uh, and also then from department regarding coronavirus, extra 3.6 billion for the devolved administration, that's at page 470. Uh, uh, can I seek agreement to consider both in conjunction with the October monitoring and the main estimates? Agreed. And also the response. Sorry, <laughs> some okay. voice comes uh, from nowhere. Response from the department regarding issues raised by the Mineral Products Association, the MPA, at pages 472. Can I ask members if there's any comments on that? If not, uh, can I seek agreement to forward uh, to MPA the uh, the response from the department regarding? No, nope, no, nope, sorry, that's wrong. Yeah. Just seek forward, agreement yeah. to forward that then. Yeah. Okay, can I seek agreement to forward that to MPA then, members? Intent. And then a uh, response from the department regarding the North South implementation bodies at page 478. Can I ask members for comments? Sure, can I say I'm glad that they brought some clarification to the issue and that um, hopefully by focusing attention on it, there'll be no departure from what is required in the legislation. I'm content with where it now sits. Okay. Uh, with that, then, can I seek agreement to note at this point? Noted. Okay. And then from the department, it's 2020 21 main estimates position at page 481. I inform members that oral evidence on the main estimates budget number three bill evidence session is scheduled at the minute for the 30th of September uh, 2020. Okay. Moving on then. Uh, from Department of Infrastructure regarding financial support for road haulage, the taxi industry and transport sector on page 490. And I ask members if there's any comments. Yeah, I just would like to say that uh, uh, I, I'm, we're all familiar with what the, the Minister is trying to do within a remit. And um, I suppose, like all of these things, we need to get the support, which is possible probably from finance. but. Uh, I think she's been very, very proactive within that remit in helping these sectors during this crisis, and has already done there. There is a summary already provided in LXA, so anything that can be done from this department in order to see that, that just not that industry, but probably the other 10,000 small independent businesses that aren't getting any help out there at all as well. So it's noted, and thank you, Chair. Okay, any other comments? Could, could I just say, I think it's... It's disappointing for that sector in particular that we're going to be able to pass the parcel between the two departments, and it's that sector which is suffering from that, and it doesn't seem to have been resolved, so <coughs> government should be about resolving issues, not just passing the parcel from one to the other. If I can add, if I can add to, not only have you know the road haulage industry um, taxi and transport sector have been hit with the, the regards to the, the horrendous financial pressures of COVID, but they've also been hit with regards to the MOT issue mm. and the driving licence issue. So they are getting, in fact, a double dunt, sometimes a triple dunt, with regards to trying to bring new people forward, trying to get people medicals, trying to get people update it, trying to get people renewed licences, and then also their vehicles. Uh, so there is, there is an issue. Uh, these people have been hit particularly bad, whilst at the same time having to operate right through this crisis. And, and I do think there needs to be more done by the executive uh, on this issue, uh, and by this minister, to be fair. Um, so I, I think this will be raised so could, uh, time and again. In could the, come in with in the you, just... Uh, I think that what you said there by the executive is correct, but I believe the minister has done m m probably as much as she can at the minute. It also has to involve the economy and the finance. So I agree with you there that the executive need to come up there and make a decision in order to help the minister of, of infrastructure get that delivered. Okay. Uh, Chair, yep. 
Justice. Yep, yeah, I, I want to make the point that this is a, a department that has got greater allocation of funding than most other departments. So I don't know what the problem is here. Has the minister got money and she hasn't allocated it to these groupings? Um, according to the minister of finance, the money has it's not his or she, her role to sort out uh, these particular organisations. It's the ministers. Thank you. Sure. I, I believe then we should ask that question, okay, because it's been asked before, but I agree with you that it is it should be sent to the executive. Yes, but I think the point is the finance minister has told us in the past he's never had a bid for this. Yeah. So is that still the position, really? Yeah. After all these weeks and months that no one anywhere in either department either together or separately, has made a bid for any of the money which is still at the centre for this purpose. Uh, uh, we should incredible. emphasise that money is still yes. there. Yeah. Yeah. Although it has reduced, it's still there. Yeah. Uh, so you know, we really need... Yeah. I, I believe this will be uh, in the floor of the Assembly very shortly because it yes, just can't go. Sure, we need to find out, and we've already asked the question before, which department this sits at. Yeah. Okay, so we can all bat it about and thump it around here and blame individual ministers. Let us send it back up to the executive and let's get a response to it. Yeah, so find out who it belongs to. Are you making a proposal or? Yes, I make an analysis proposal. Proposal that we send back to the executive and right, right. So right to the executive. Yes. Right to the executive office. Yes, and find out which department. Yep. Either the economy. Or finance, and that we're concerned with regards to the lack of support for road haulage, tax industry, and transport Thank you. sector. You happy enough for that yes. terminology? Okay, members agreed. Yep. Okay, yep. Can I then then ask uh, move on then to the response by the department regarding the financial pressures facing the civil service and the Department of Finance? That's at page four hundred and ninety-six. Can I inform members the response does not include reference to potential costs in relation to and the cloud judgment, which uh, Jim has raised here today. Uh, can I ask members uh, for any comments, or are you happy enough to seek agreement to note, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, bring, uh, we'll, we'll pick it up again when we get the uh, presentation? I think, I think, yeah, okay. I was going to say we should be asked to be kept informed on this issue. Yep, we can certainly do that. Sort of members agree that we asked to be kept informed? Yep. Okay, can I ask then that uh, we move on then to the department from the, the letter from the department regarding the civil service injury benefits scheme amendment scheme Northern Ireland 2020, which is at page 499. Can I draw members' attention to the rules to the civil service injury benefits scheme amendment Northern Ireland uh, are not statutory rules; they are not subject to assembly control. Can I inform members then that this amendment will be presented as an SL5 at the meeting of the 16th of September 2020? An SL5, that's, that's a new. Keith, you want to enlighten us, enlighten us on it's that? A, it's a pre proposal document just that outlines um, a rule that essentially doesn't have a. doesn't sit within the Assembly's remit but will apply to. Right, have an effect. Yes, so okay. it is. So it, 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 yeah, um, it, it's terms that we tend to use for different documents. So there's an SL5 and an SL1 for mm -hmm. proposal for subordinates. So this is a SL5, which is a proposal for for this type of um, of, of of rule. Yep. Okay. Members content then. Yep. Okay. Can I seek agreement to note that then? Uh, and then also moving on from the department, the monthly outturn and forecast, May, June 2020, page 505. And then from the department, the monthly outturn and forecast for July 2020, page 522. Can I inform members the outturn and forecast data provides uh, to the committee on a monthly basis? However, due to COVID, this was subject to delays. Uh, the committee collects this information in order to commission raise to provide an analysis. Can I seek agreement to per, uh, forward the recent uh, data uh, to the RAIS service and to commission a quarterly analysis, uh, analysis of the financial forecasting performance of the departments? Content? Okay. Agreed? Yeah. Uh, then the response from the Minister regarding the RHA disciplinary process, that's at page 538. 
Uh, members want to comment? Sure. Uh, yep. Uh, uh, it's just uh, uh, I'm just looking at that. I've, I've written down that uh, this is really details of the number of staff which have been disciplined over RHI. I think that we need to confirm the request, which is fine. So it may get at some point in the future where the civil service staff will be used as a scapegoat, which is unfair, I think, due to the number and the involvement of ministers. So we need to watch that very carefully. Okay. I must say I agree largely with Pat on that, that. I think there is culpability within the civil service, but it would be a perverse outcome if civil servants only uh, paid any price. For RHI, though I must say there's not much sign in this correspondence that too many might, but we are being offered information on a confidential basis, and I think we should agree to that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I seek agreement then to request from the Department a copy of the departmental guidance on assembly committees, as referred to in the minister's letter, and then can I also seek agreement to write to the speaker to outline the committee's uh, frustration with obtaining the requested information and ask that the Speaker write to the Minister for Finance to outline the lack of information that the Committee is receiving on this matter. I know that this is something that Steve had raised as Chair of the Committee. Are members uh, content and, uh, to agree that, to write to the Speaker? Sorry, just to share, the lack of information we are receiving on... Just on the letter itself, he, uh, the oh, Chair yeah. has been frustrated at the, the information uh, the requesting of the information, and, and he has asked that the Speaker write to the Minister of Finance to outline the lack of information that the Committee is receiving on this matter. Well, Keith, I, mean, sure, I, I can comment a wee bit on that. Um, I know the, the second page of the letter sets out a number of um, conditions mm. on the Committee receiving the information, um, which generally does not happen. Um, and so it was to seek confirmation on what guidance are they using that they're going to put these conditions in place, um, because we do get confidential information and that's fine, but it's the specific conditions that they're mentioning here, um, I think was the issue that the chair had, um, and he felt that um, it may be best to, to write to the speaker just to highlight we're not getting the information we've required and we're having to, to agree to these conditions, which we're not really sure apply. Um, so I, I know that was what the, the chair had mentioned was, yeah. was his issue with it. Are members content? Sorry, just to the chair again, but what information does the chair feel has not been offered? So it's not so much the, comp it's not so much the information yet, because, but, but it's the conditions by which we get the information. Well, that's different from what you had said earlier on. But it is the information, sure. It's a number of and the grades of those in respect of whom there's discipline, the many are moving to formal discipline, uh, the number who've resigned or retired after being notified about discipline. It's all those issues that, yeah. like, I would have thought those are data questions, you know. We're not asking for names. Yeah. We're asking for the number and the grade profiles. Yeah. Um, so I don't really see why that has to be cloaked in confidentiality. Yeah, yeah. And that's I, the point. I, and whilst I'm doing a bad job of trying to explain Steve's no, position, that that's basically what he's, he's saying. That he, he's, he's frustrated at the, the fact that we're not getting the information, and then when we do have to get information, it's, it's caveated with condition uh, around the confidentiality of it all. But as you say, some of this could be quite data-driven, dry question answers. And data driven can be redacted, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and it doesn't have to be personal or, or Yeah. Uh, but I, I make the point again just that uh, it was stated by the chair, just uh, it was implied in the statement that as if there's some information that had been requested and was been withheld. But that's not the case. I think that uh, what one is saying is that we may be objecting to um, the conditions in relation to information that's been provided, but no information has been requested that where the Minister has refused to supply it. Sorry, that's not yep. right. Like yep. The letter at page 538 yep. recites the request 
such as Irish said it a minute ago, for what we're looking for, mm-hmm. yeah. and then goes on to say, effectively, you're not getting it, but only, but you could get it on a confidential basis. I think the point is, why has it been labelled as confidential? Yeah. It's not data protection stuff. Well, I think that's, that's the issue. point. Yeah. So I think I think the chair's a problem must be the fact that it's been couched. In other words, we're not being given it, but it's been hidden behind confidentiality, which it shouldn't be. Which then prolongs the process of yeah. us obtaining the information required. And, and I suppose it's the process also. Uh, so certainly, can I ask that we seek agreement to write to the Speaker to outline the committee's frustration with obtaining the requested information and ask that the Speaker write to the Minister for Finance to outline the lack of information that the committee is receiving on this matter. And again, it, we all received a letter from the Speaker this week with regards to how he wants business conducted in the future. So I, I suspect that's you know, why Steve is wanting then to write to the Speaker to highlight this issue to him with regards to the functioning of the committees and the scrutiny uh, responsibilities thereof. Uh, I, I must say I support the Chair in that. I think that we do need to keep the Speaker informed of things like this. And frustration, I think, is at a high level, given what we've experienced over the last number of months uh, before recess around information and how we're getting information and how we're having to obtain information the hard way. So I suppose that all plays into that mix. Uh, I'm sorry, Chair, but I have to come back again on this issue. Uh, I think that, the, that you're actually confusing two issues here. I think that you can write to the Speaker and question why it is that one is uh, requiring um, confidentiality and the release of the information. But to move to that second stage is where you're assuming that information uh, that is as requested has not been sort of released. That, that's a totally different issue. Can, can, can. Uh, and uh, I, I can support you if you uh, are writing to the chair, quite, or to, to the speaker, uh, on the basis of why is this information classified as confidential? Uh, sure. But I don't think you have to move uh, to yes. the second stage at I'll, all. I'll bring Pat in and then I'll make a suggestion. I, I really think we're not asking for a lot. The number of any great profile of staff who have been subject to disciplinary investigations, the number of those investigations, the number of staff who have resigned or retired, and a copy of the NICA's report on the the outcome. I'm sorry, I think that we should be entitled to that and without any sort of confidentiality or whatever it is that's put out from that. I don't agree with the department there at all. Uh, I would agree with you, Pat. Sorry, Sean. Just uh, just a quick one, uh, Chair. I know that we have said we don't want names, but if we get this detail, we then begin to put names to it because it could be one at a high level, so it then comes a guessing game. So, yeah. Can I suggest that we formulate a letter that would be sent to the Speaker so that we all can agree it uh, beforehand, before it's sent? Members agreed with that? Yeah, and could I suggest, just in that, that if one was uh, questioning about the issue of confidentiality, I have no difficulty in agreeing that, but not implying that in some way that... Uh, the minister or anyone else is holding back in terms no, of not doing that, being but, but, but he no. has, he has. Well, well actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you see, you see, you can see just how it is that even within this group here, that there's two different interpretations. That Mr. Cackney believes that uh, he's not applying that, whereas Mr. Alistair believes that there is an application there. So I do think that again, that in drafting that letter, you can question why it is that this information should be subject to confidentiality. So, well, we'll ask just what? the last point I want to make. So, take in mind we've asked for, take in mind it's been refused and we've done the agreement. It's provided in line with the procedure to set out in paragraph 77 of the departmental guidance. I mean, uh, do you have to be a legal expert now for just to try to get a wee bit of information? And the only point that I raised on that there was that was about civil servants, the staff, the ordinary workers. The, that are, I don't want them used as scapegoats, and that's why I wanted to see that information. Uh, because in that RHI inquiry, there was high level um, involvement from ministers. So I'm only looking after the civil servants and trying to get the information to the committee that we need for that. I don't think that's a big ask. 
Okay, well, what we'll do is we'll formulate... Pause 5A would help us. Huh? Pause 5A would help us. <laughs> yes in point. There you go. Yes in point. Three. So we'll formulate a letter. The, the chair will have his input to that along with the clerk and then we'll issue it to members to agree. Are members happy enough with that? Agreed. Okay. Uh, can I move on then to uh, the letter from the Minister regarding public expenditure 2020-21 COVID-19 urgent allocations, which is at page 540. Uh, can I remind members that on the 17th of August, uh, committee members were asked to email to agree to forward this correspondence from the Minister to the Committees of Health, Economy, Education, Communities and Infrastructure. Can I inform members that the following members agreed for the correspondence to be circulated? Uh, Steve Egan, myself, Pat McCartney, Jim Wells, Jim Alistair, Nisha McHugh, Gemma Dolan and Matthew O'Toole. Uh, so, seek a formal agreement then for the purpose of recording into the minutes to forward correspondence from the Minister of Finance regarding August COVID-19 allegations to the Committees for Health, Economy, Education, Committees and Infrastructure. All agreed? That's yes. just getting it, keeping it formal. Moving on then, from the Development Trust NIDTNI report uh, from Coronavirus to Community Wealth, Building Back better in Northern Ireland. That's at page 544. Can I ask members if there are any comments at this stage? If there are no comments, can I inform members due to the committee's current workload and the restricted meeting opportunities, it would not be possible to arrange an oral evidence session in the foreseeable future. So are members content to note? Okay, moving on, response from the Department on the Digital Economy Act 2017, is, that's at page 575. And I remind members at the meeting on the 8th of July, the Committee for Justice wrote to the Committee about the Digital Economy Act 2017. A legislative consent motion on the devolved provisions of the Act should have been uh, considered by the Finance Committee. However, due to the ab absence of the Assembly, the, the Act was passed by Westminster. And I inform members the previous Committee for Finance received oral evidence on the bill and raised no concerns. That session was covered by Hansard. Can I inform members that the response includes detailed briefings on the Act and advises that the Minister is waiting further correspondence from the Secretary of State for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport before consulting with Executive Ministers? Uh, do members want to discuss or comment on that? That's at page... Five seven five. If not, can I seek agreement that the committee write to the department uh, to request that it be kept informed of any developments? Okay, agreed. Agreed. Uh, next letter then from the Energy Efficiency Group (NI) regarding incorporating energy efficiency measures into Northern Ireland's recovery. That's at page nine hundred. Can I ask members if there are any comments or are members content uh, to note? Content to note at this stage. Moving well, on then. an upcoming energy strategy, isn't there? Presumably. Yeah, yeah, we'll tie in with that. Yeah. Members content then. Moving on then from the Department regarding public sector pay policy 2020-21, page 901. Uh, again, any comments, members? If not, are members content to note at this stage? Okay, agreed. And then a member, uh, I think it's tabled, uh, I think it is tabled this one, uh, a member of the Association of Northern Ireland Travel Agents, uh, tabled at page 11. Yeah, again, I've got something I sent in. Yep, again, this is. Uh, to, just to not to detain committee, the issue there is that travel agents are in a somewhat unique position that people who booked holidays last year paid for them. The travel agent got their commission at that time and now those holidays are being refunded and the commission is probably already spent. There's no new bookings coming in and they're in a totally desperate situation. Sense of economy, do we? Yeah. I, if I could, de uh, I'll declare an interest at this point. Uh, my daughter actually uh, went through work experience 
uh, with the, the business owner in question. Uh, at this point, I declare that interest. My daughter worked for uh, them on a, I think it was a week, uh, for work experience. Uh, can I seek agreement then to ask the department what specific financial support has been provided for this sector, and if any proposals have come from the Department of Economy to support the sector? Agreed. Okay. Or, or should we also send the letter to the Economy Committee? Yeah. Wouldn't. Yeah. Maybe, the, maybe they've already done that. Just by way of information, I've actually batted that letter up to the Minister of the Economy uh, in a constituency guise. Okay. Uh, so you're aware. Okay. Right, just to the Chair, and you know, it's still a continuing feature as well too, that so many um, businesses, in particular whenever it's a sole trader and the likes of it, have fallen through the net. And I think it is the Minister of the Economy uh, that should be addressing that particular issue. Uh, and I can think of a number of cases that I'm actually attempting, and that's the only word that one could use, uh, to deal with at the present time, but finding uh, little or no avenue um, uh, of support that can be sort of established that type of person. So maybe if it could be uh, included in that letter as well to uh, what initiatives are to be brought forward, in particular for those that find themselves in that position. Okay. You heard that, members. Agreed. Okay, members, you're glad to know that I, I'll seek agreement now to note all the remaining items of correspondence, unless someone wants to, a member wants to raise a specific uh, element of that that we haven't raised, we haven't went through. Okay, agreed? Agreed. Could I seek agreement to note the information requested, uh, request to the Department and routine papers circulated on the 4th of September 2020? Members agreed? Okay, moving on then to... Uh, that's beyond the correspondence now. We're on to forward work programme. Can I draw members' attention to the budget 2021-2020? Chairman, were we moving into a uh, private session for this? No, not yet. Not well, yet. Because I want to raise something before we do. That's okay. Just, uh, I'll, I'll give you one, in, Jim, before we move into private session. But, so if I can draw members' attention then to the budget 2021-22 timetable, which is at page 94. Eight. I inform members uh, a paper from the Department on the review of financial process has been received. Can I seek agreement from members are they, if they are content to consider the written evidence on September the 16th, followed by an oral evidence session from the Department on the 7th of October? Members agreed. And I inform members that a briefing note has been received from RIA's uh, Personal Protection Equipment Make and Buy in Scotland. Uh, can I seek agreement from members to a presentation by RIA's on this briefing note on the 16th of September? Agreed. 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 And I inform members that the updated forward work programme to December 2020 is at page 950. <coughs> Doesn't look that scary, really. Uh, can I seek agreement that members are content with the forward work programme? Uh, well, just can I go back to the point about my bill? Yep. I don't see anything in it in that connection, but I can see a situation emerge once we get to October. Things are going to get pretty crowded with budget stuff, so I would stress the need again uh, to maybe get this out of the way. Get things front loaded during September. Yep. Um, if we're going to hear from the bills, Mark, I anticipate then there'll be a general discussion about pros and cons of the bill, and then ultimately a clause by clause. So does that mean two meetings or three? The, the meeting, if it's the same as we received last week, it's basically just an overview of the <laughs> legislative process and when and where you can put amendments in, if need be, and the scope of a bill. That will yeah. be discussed, I would imagine. Yeah, but, but when do we as a committee discuss yep. yeah. the bill? Generally, um, committees with a bill will have an informal closed session yes. to have the informal discussions, and then the following week we'll do the formal clause by clause. Yeah. So normally that takes, again, normally a two week process, one, a process yeah. one after the other. Um, so there'll be an informal discussion around trying to make decisions. 
um, yes. and then there be the formal clause by clause the following week. So can we anticipate getting all that done in September? Well, certainly I, I'd speak to um, the, the committee team, so well to see about scheduling the, the bill in. Yeah, because once we hit October, I think it's going to be a lot of budgetary stuff. I, I don't know if at two hours, well, I'm not encouraging people to be verbose, but I don't know how long the session would be required to discuss the bill. All right, just to say again, that CLG next week are considering um, revision of the timing, so hopefully after next week you'll get your normal slot back on a Wednesday afternoon, All right. um, which should allow longer than the normal two hours you've been having in here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, well, and we need to get back to that as soon as possible, to be fair. Okay. Can I see agreement then that members are content with the forward work programme? Agreed. Uh, okay, uh, item number 13 is any other business. Uh, Jim, you had indicated. Yes, this, this falls within the ambit of this committee, and that's the General Registry Office uh, sent out a letter to all the churches in Northern Ireland uh, just after the recess, just before the recess actually, in which there was an implicit threat that if they didn't uh, comply with the department's uh, views on this issue, their right to hold marriage ceremonies would be withheld. Um, this caused a huge degree of concern among churches of all denominations, indeed all religious groups in Northern Ireland. Um, the department later admitted it was a mistake, but it's a gross mistake. And I think initially we should be asking the department to give us a full black background explanation as to what went wrong here. Who authorised that letter? The churches, all the churches in Northern Ireland, because understand both the Minister and the Permanent Secretary are saying they never saw it. Who authorised this and what steps are taken to certain that such a disgraceful situation never arises again in Northern Ireland? This is a monumental error and uh, it does defy all logic that that letter ever went out to all the governing bodies of our churches in Northern Ireland. And, um, I, I just was absolutely flabbergasted when I saw it. So I think it's incumbent upon this uh, committee to get to the bottom of what on earth has happened here to make certain that such a situation never arises again. Okay, members, any other comments on this issue? I know that I have been approached by yeah. several people, members of the public, uh, and media even, uh, about this issue. Uh, are members content to proceed yeah, as Jim has proposed? Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you, Jim. Any other members want to raise any items business at this point. Okay, uh, 14 then is date and time and place of next meeting. That sounds as if we're about to walk out this room, but we're not. Um, I, I question sure, maybe sorry, can I go back just? I, yep. don't, I don't know if now's the time, John. I, I, I was going to raise just before we go in there, just, I, could we get an update on where we are, the department is, um, uh, with the uh, fiscal council? Yep. Okay. Is that, does that, would that be possible? An update, that? yep. Seek, seek an update as to yes. where we're at in the whole process of yes. forming a fiscal Please. council. Okay, members agreed? Yep. Okay. Okay, the next meeting is on Wednesday, the 16th of September 2020 at 12.30 in the Senate Chamber. For people's information. Okay, item number 15 then is correspondence regarding the Joint Order for Personal Protective Equipment at PPE. The following papers relate uh, to this agenda item are the clerk's brief, uh, joint order for PPE on page 958, the departmental response to the finance committee, read joint order for PPE on page 959, clerk's brief with regards to the PPE order of the non-sensitive emails at page 960, 960, and then the letter from the minister read PPE and associated non-sensitive emails on page 963. Uh, the papers delivered in hard copy to members are the, in, the, con the confidential papers, and within that there's a clerk's brief, uh, the PPE order, confidential emails, and then the commercially sensitive emails, uh, which I have had before uh, the recess. And I advise members relating to papers dis delivered in the confidential pack should only be referred to in the closed session as agreed with the Minister of Finance. 
Uh, so before I open it to the floor of this uh, committee, can I raise a, a couple of issues uh, out of uh, the letters that are in our packs, page 959, and this is from the Permanent Secretary Sue Gray in her response uh, dated the 3rd of September around the joint order. Uh, and it was out of the committee asking questions about how this information was handled. How was it that we got some emails whenever we had asked for all papers? And then how come there was another batch of non-sensitive emails appeared and then obviously the confidential sensitive emails that appeared? Even within that, even within the confidential papers we, we, we received, there was emails that we had already received initially. Uh, so it struck me as the whole management system seemed to be uh, wrong or disjointed or broken. Uh, and I note in Sue's letter, uh, Ms Gray's letter, Permanent Secretary, that the information was handled in accordance with the Department's information management policy. Well, I honestly think that we need to find out more about the management policy and the operation. Uh, we need to know more about how that actually operates. And that in itself might ask, answer some of the questions that we posed with regards to how did they differentiate between emails. Because when we first asked about the emails and we discovered that there was two days missing, well then we have got a lot more emails for other days that weren't forthcoming in the first place. Uh, and this, I believe, now has moved on from PPE. We, we know that the PP order failed. We, know, we, we think we know the reasons for that. Uh, and, and we now have moved on to how information is actually disseminated and given down to this committee. Uh, in relation, and I'll read out of Sue's letter, in relation to your question regarding the release of the non-commercially sensitive emails, the committee original request of the 9th of April asked for and she quotes back, all papers relating to the reported joint order, including the relevant emails between officials from the Rep Department of Finance and the Government of the Republic of Ireland, setting out the detail of the required PP that was sought. The committee was provided with the relevant email setting out the detail of the required PP sought. No, we were not. That is not the case. Uh, she goes on to say the emails provided to the committee on the 1st of July were in response to further requests, and this included commercially sensitive and non-sensitive correspondence. Well, I am sorry, folks, but Sue even quotes back our line, and our line states that all papers, we asked for all papers relating to the reported joint order, including relevant emails between the officials from both jurisdictions. And this is blatant nonsense from the, from the permanent secretary and I believe she is treating this committee with absolute and outright contempt and derision. When she can't even read, she quotes our line, and it's very clear the first word of that line is all papers, all. And to say that we then made further requests is treating this committee with contempt. We have only ever asked initially for all the papers, on the 9th of April, for all the papers relating to the joint order. And we have never, and I, I suspect that we still have not received all the emails and papers relating to this issue. And why I base my judgment on this is, is, is quite clear. Nowhere in any of these emails that we have read, either the sensitive or the non-sensitive, is there ever an acknowledgement that the order failed. There, there are warning signs, there are cautious steps, and then there, of course, there is the, the quite embarrassing email that we are able to talk about regarding how the official from the Finance Committee sent down the Minister's statement and then, very quickly, the official from the Republic of Ireland came back and says, no, hold on, this is not correct. You need to rectify that. And an email went back from the Department of Finance to state that, OK, I will speak to the press office. So on that point, 
I want to know, and this committee should know, the processes after that email exchange. Who did that person go to with regards to the press office? What was done to rectify that press statement? What was done in informing the press? But also, what was done within the department to suggest that, OK, we have issued this statement and it's not correct. The Republic of Ireland officials are now stating that, that we went too far too soon. How do we rectify this and what does this mean for the joint order in the, in the, in the, in the first instance? All of that information is, is still vague and unseen to us. Uh, so I want to know the Department's information management policy. I want to know what action was taken when the Republic of Ireland official warned the Department of Finance that they have issued a press statement in error, that it is wrong, and I want to know what action was taken after that. Um, and I believe that there is information still out there on email that we have not yet seen. And at this stage, having been through all of this month in, month out, week in, week out, I am at the point where I have lost all confidence in this department and I have lost all confidence in the Permanent Secretary whenever she sends us a letter dated the 3rd of September where she is blatantly, blatantly ignoring our requests but yet using our terminology uh, and citing it in her letter. It's treating this committee with contempt. And, and I'm not content at all. In fact, I'm more concerned now than I have ever been. Even having seen the emails, I'm more concerned than I've ever been with regards to the transparency and the accountability of this department and of the Permanent Secretary. Uh, information is the currency of democracy. Transparency and accountability is what builds trust, and at the minute my trust is zero. I'll open it out to our members. Yeah, uh, just to the chair, um, and um, I appreciate that question. The chair today would probably just heard there was very much your own opinion, uh, just of uh, your trust in terms of uh, the department and the ministry as well. Uh, I'm not of the same opinion as yourself at all. Uh, I've actually um, am on record as having stated that uh, the minister at the time had done his utmost uh, to support uh, the Minister of Health in acquiring PPEs. And we do know that uh, that, that order did not come to flourishing. Uh, not that it deterred in any respect the minister in his continuing uh, effort to ensure that both the resources were made available to uh, the Ministry of Health and support was given as well to in order to uh, establish supply lines in terms of PPEs. And I have to commend the Minister uh, in every way that he has uh, addressed that issue. And even um, a number of weeks ago, I attended along with him when he visited uh, O'Neill's in Straban, again to one of the suppliers that we do have of uh, PPEs. And whilst it's recognised that in no way at all that can we ever meet the demand, not only here on the island of Ireland, nor even in the UK itself, for the amount of PPEs that will be required uh, in the future, that we do depend very, very much on uh, those lines of communication, lines of supply, and that uh, from China in particular. Uh, and I think that I'm sure you're well enough aware as well, too, that where uh, one warehouse actually in uh, Britain uh, was full of PPEs that couldn't actually be used where they didn't meet the required standards and so on of what was expected at the time that they had established in order there. So those difficulties do arise when one is competing in the world market and attempting to secure the likes of PPEs and uh, established suppliers that are going to continue to provide one with PPEs of the appropriate standard and the likes of it. Now, we have harrowed, we have ploughed, and we have harrowed again this ground time and time again. Uh, in fact, it's old news now. Uh, there's no one else who is actually interested in it other than you, uh, uh, Chair, uh, in that respect. And that uh, where I do think that it's time that this committee 
uh, concentrated and uh, work that uh, we still have to do uh, in relation to other affairs that are continuing uh, to come down the line and to confront us on the committee uh, and then dealing with the Department of Finance. Um, I proposed previously that uh, it should be noted as red and we should move on. I'm still of that same opinion that uh, we have as much information as we so require. And I know that you said that we shouldn't refer to all the confidential documents, and I want not any of the content of it, other than I have never seen as much Chinese written in all my life as what I've seen this last while, which isn't of much use to me as someone who isn't conversant uh, in Chinese. Uh, but again, I, I make the point, um, I really do think that um, this is a time-wasting exercise. It's kite flying and it isn't doing the reputation of this committee any good uh, and it isn't going to come to any other resolution other than to confirm the fact that the minister at that time done his own utmost in supporting other ministers within this government uh, to achieve PPEs. It didn't come to fruition, but in fact, he continued to work and established other supply lines. Can I say, Minister, that a lot of what you've said there I would, could actually agree with, with regards to best endeavours of a minister of this uh, uh, executive trying their best to get PPE. To me, the issue has moved on far away from the actual field order, and it's all about information that the committee is requesting and not receiving. And when we do receive information, it has to be wrung out. In fact, not even wrung out. We had to threaten to go to court in order to get these latest batches of emails, both the sensitive and the non-sensitive stuff. When I can't see for the life of me why we weren't able to get that information when we first requested it. And for me, if we can't obtain information when we ask for it, it then becomes a trust issue on every single issue we require information on. Not about PPE, not about any other aspect, but every, every single issue that we request information on. And then it becomes that trust issue. Jim, I'll bring you in. You want it? Anybody else? Anybody come in after Jim? Yeah, Chair. Um, I suppose we can all understand the anxiety of the Sinn Féin members of this committee to sweep this all onto the carpet because the finance minister from their party uh, was found somewhat exposed, having boasted of an order which didn't exist. And the key question for me has always been, in making that boast, what was his state of knowledge? That's why I tabled a written question back in July. It's AQW 5696. And I asked the Minister of Finance in relation to the email of 1751 hours on the 27th of March, which I believe is the one which said in response to the statement from Dublin saying there is no order. I, I asked the minister um, when he and when his permanent secretary were made aware of the contents of that email to the effect that no joint order for personal protection equipment had been placed nor had a supplier even been identified. And the answer to that question is, which came on the 28th of July, is very interesting. My permanent secretary and I were made aware of the contents of the OGP email on the 27th of March. So with the knowledge, nonetheless, the statements continued to be made. The assembly was addressed on the 1st or the 2nd of April uh, without any indication that there wasn't an order. And that, I think, is the issue of probity that's at the heart of this. That if the minister was aware on the 27th of March of an email from the Republic saying there is no order, why did he continue to propagate the idea that he had secured an order? That, to me, is the key issue. And then I think a secondary issue is the point you've identified, Chair, 
that the information policy of the department, the permanent secretary says that allows her to behave as she behaved. Well, if it does, then it's certainly something they need to look at. I think it's worth pointing out and, and reading again into the record the content of the email from the official down south whenever he received the press statement from our department. It says, thanks for advising. The announcement is unhelpful in that it does not reflect where we are at. The North-South collaboration is the right thing to do and we hope to be in a position to work through a joint order. But we are not there yet. We have yet to identify a supplier who can take an order. We are briefing our Minister and the Department of the, the Taoiseach on this as we speak. But it would be really helpful if this could be corrected immediately so that it does not create embarrassment for either government. Many thanks, regards. What time is that email? And that email was sent on the 27th of March 2020 at 17.59. And there was an acknowledgement by the official from the Department of Finance. Completely understand, I speak to our press office. Yes. But yet. And the Minister knew about that email. Told me that. But yet, nothing seems to have been done. And the narrative continues. And you could ascertain then that there could well be the case that the Minister blatantly goes into the Assembly Chamber and misinforms yeah. the Assembly. Yeah. He says in this answer on Tuesday, the 31st of March, that's the date it was, I provided an update in the Assembly. Yeah. But he didn't tell us. What that email told him. So, so I on on these on this specific email, I, I would like to see, uh, I would like to see what action was taken, uh, and what processes were in play. How was this re rectified to the satisfaction of the official in the Republic of Ireland? Uh, I can see I can see how this is embarrassing for the department and the minister, but this this is the kernel of the issue, uh, and it's something that we can't unsee. This was not sensitive email. This was not a conf confidential email. This was released to us in the non-sensitive badge. Uh, and again, even how that operation manifests itself as to who decided what email should be declared sensitive and what email should have been declared non-sensitive and then confidential. I can't ascertain any process or thorough thought process or logic as to how that was uh, simulated down and who made those decisions as to what was sensitive and what was not. And that's information that we need to know for going forward with regards to the level of trust that this scrutiny committee needs uh, to this department. And if trust is out the window, we still need this information because we are the scrutinizer of this department. And I must say, I am I'm very disappointed in the way that this has been handled by this department. This is not a massive, this is not a big, massive policy issue where parties, political parties can disagree. This is about information coming down to this committee. And, it's, and the, the department has failed time and time again. Any other members want to add anything at this point? Uh, Chair, it just seems to be going on and back and forward with us. And hear what everyone has to say. Uh, I, I, I would really, I'd like to find some sort of closure on this. I mean, is there one more letter to ask for any of those concerns? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I really want to move on from it. Yeah. You know, as well. I'm just trying to think what settles everyone here. I mean. We've asked for other, uh, earlier on there, to, we, we, we've asked for other bits of information to come down. I, I'm looking at the, at the mouth of that pandemic and trying as best as we possibly can to get PPE equipment out to all the places that needed it. And looking at myself and business, how difficult it is in order to try and 
bring stock in before a busy time, and that's in a small business. But I do see letters going back and forward, and I hear what you're saying. But on our original point, that information has come forward to us. We all agree with that. No, I still, think, still, I still think there's emails missing. Right. I Sim Simply because there is no email that suggests that the order has failed. Uh, I also want to know... I also want to know what, how the management system works, right. who made the decision as to what was sensitive, what was not, what was released at the, the initial request, uh, the first request, and then what came after. I want to know who made uh, that decision. Oh, okay, so I'm taking that in mind. and uh, we're, we're confidential, aren't we? No, no, no this is open. open. Okay, so what, where I would like to be, where I would like to see this committee, I'd like to see this committee as well, progress in itself on having a relationship with the department which allows us to bring forward some proposals in order to try and mitigate what's coming down the tracks at us in the future. Now, if we find ourselves uh, going back again and again over these issues, I think it's sapping the energy maybe off the committee. Now, I, 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 what I'm trying to say and get out is that we Somewhere I need to find closure on this here. I mean, I, I, I hear that there were letters going back and forward and emails going back and forward, but surely we have uh, visions of, of what's, what's happening with us on the COVID-19, uh, on the pandemic, on the shortage of money, on the 10,000 people that find themselves without any income there at the minute that are self-employed, in the public houses that find that are over £51,000 of NAV, that they're not getting any help or any assistance. I've already spoke on all of this, as, as we all have uh, in the Chamber. I want to uh, try to... I don't want to be making this out as th there's an issue or a sides issue with this, but I want the relationship with the Department that we're coming forward as well with ideas and feeling that we're playing our part, all of us together. Uh, yes, there is talk within people holding back papers, but that, that's talk within the executive. It seems to be part of the culture from I have come in here, that people in different departments are holding back things. Surely when we went into that executive and we signed up on that executive as partners all together, everything should be flowing, everything should be free and coming out because you cannot run a business if one section of that business is pulling against the other. So I, I really have uh, want to try and move on and come in with what's left of this mandate in order to try and help our citizens here in Northern Ireland as best we can within this committee and within the department. So uh, if it's a letter from yourself, Chair, that's fine, but I don't know anymore. I, mean, I just want, I mean, if it's a do we have to vote here on this, or what are we going to do in this? How, how do we move on from this position, Chair? Well, on that question, specific question, I have asked that we write a letter back to ask the questions around, uh, or I will make a proposal to ask the questions around the management system, who made the decision around the disclosure of the information, and then what action was taken after the Republic of Ireland official uh, raised concerns about the press statement that was ushered. Now, that's as simple as me proposing that and the committee either agreeing or not agreeing it. Uh, and that's what I would like the committee to do. Because on your point about the executive, and I agree with you, this is not a party political issue. This is about the assembly and the executive. And the point you make about the culture of not releasing information, okay, it's not down to one party. It's the executive. Okay? If a scrutiny committee gives up on trying to change that culture, then we have lost. We have lost. And that, that's, it's about democracy and about making sure the people of Northern Ireland gets the government they deserve. And if a, if a scrutiny committee f loses the will to fight on, then we're in a bad place. That's what I would say there, Pat. But, but if, if, if I make the proposal we right back on the, on the questions that I posed, we can move on and we can see all the good stuff that you're talking about in partnership. And support. That's where I want to be, and that's where we can be. But we can also ascertain what happened to the information that we sought. We can. We'll always be able to push and 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 apply for information at any given time on any given subject. That's that right. will not diminish the work that we have to continue to do with the department. Right. Yeah.
Peter, bring in Sean then, Jim. Okay. Yeah, um, Chair, you said earlier on you'd lost all confidence in the department and the permanent sector. So I don't know what's going to satisfy you. We're writing back, we're chasing our tails. Um, I've heard this before, one more letter, we'll come back. It's trawled over, there's points looked into, there's another angle, let's write back again. So this is dragging on, as I agree, I've had a sap in the will out of this. You could almost say that this becomes dysfunctional if we keep going on like this. You've lost all confidence in the department and the permanent sector, so I don't know what's going to satisfy you. Information is ultimately where we need to be. Uh, and that's my personal opinion. It's not the committee's yeah. view. I, I said it as a personal opinion. But until we get the answers of the questions we request, then how could we have confidence? But, but again, when you talk about sapping a life out, we have just conducted a meeting where we went through all this business. We have went through good business. We went through all the correspondence. That's what a committee does. But it also should fight and scrap for every bit of information it can obtain in order to do its scrutiny role properly. I'll bring in Jim. And I'll uh, just to bring this to a conclusion today, I was going to second your proposal. We, I don't think we're going to change any minds uh, and vote on it and move on. Minister, so I'll bring you in and then we will. And just the finally, uh, on that point, now, I agree entirely with Pat that has sapped the energy out of this committee in every respect. And and what Sean has alluded to as well, too, that where I don't think that there's any end to this letter sending uh, one with the other. I don't think that uh, the chair will ever be satisfied one way or the other. And that whenever one talked about this drip drip, we'll say, of information or release of papers, you're actually maybe confusing two issues here in a sense, uh, apart from the issues that have been raised here in relation to the Minister of Finance and so on. I think that you're also alluding to how it is that people get their papers very, very late at the end of the day when it comes to executive meetings and the likes of it. And I suggest that uh, maybe the chair should go back into his own party and raise that issue, and raise that issue in particular, and ask that question. Why is it that other people within the executive are very late in actually receiving their papers and so on? Because he might find that he, it's in there that he'll find the answer to that as well too. That in itself is a very different issue from the issue in relation to the Minister of Finance and the acquisition of PPEs and the likes of it. There is absolutely no way that, and now having moved the goalposts, uh, that and attempting to make it into a, an issue entirely different from what it was at the outset. If we're going to get any resolution of that either, it prolongs just the agony in every respect. And there is a proposal on the floor, uh, and I'd actually make a counter-proposal in relation to PPEs. If we note all of these discussions now have been held and haven't been read the communication that we move on from it. So on your points that you addressed to me personally, Minister, I, I, this is not a party political thing, and I would remind members that they're on this committee to scrutinise the department for which we are tasked to do. This is not party political for me, nor has it ever been, and nor will it ever be in any committee that I sit on. I will interrogate the information, no matter who the minister would be, and ultimately that's what every single one of us need to do. And secondly, I will be satisfied. I will be satisfied when I have all the answers for the questions that this committee poses and asks. And, and so I will put my proposal to the meeting that we write back on the issues that I raised, and I'd ask members to vote. All members for? All members against? Uh, Mr Chairman, can I just check, do you, does an online vote count? Yeah, I'm sure it does. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So three members for, three members against. The chair has the presiding vote. No. No false. It falls. It falls. Okay, members. Are members content with that? Yeah. Uh, and I ask that my proposal now is put to the floor. And in relation to PPEs, all communications have been read, and that we now move on. Okay. Right, that's the consequence of the fall yeah, of that. the motion. Yeah. Again, that's superfluous, is it not? Oh, to have it in record. Okay, members you, agreed? I don't think we need to vote on that, Chair. Right, okay. Well, I've, asked to have, I've asked to have it on record. 
Okay. Another vote, or a vote on something that, that isn't possible. All right, have the vote. I, okay. I, I have asked to have it on right. Okay, we'll have we'll have the vote. So you've heard this is proposal that we note it. All those in favour? Three. All those against? Three. With one abstention. Again, that motion falls. Okay. With regards to, uh, there is no need then, members, to move into a closed session with regards to discussing the non the, the sensitive material. Members content to leave that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so then we move on then uh, to 16, which is the operational plan. The following papers relate to the agenda item: clerk's brief, operational plan, page 1065. Uh, the, the operational plan itself is at page 1068, and the Committee for Finance Strategic Plan 2020-2022, page 1074. Uh, can I invite the clerk to speak yes, on this? Chair, this is to be in closed session. Oh, sorry. Is, so yep. you... okay. I'm going to uh, ask members to agree to go into closed session. Members agreed? Agreed. Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Senate Chamber, program signed.